Uh, Mark, and to the final talk of the dark. Great, thank you. Well, I'm here at the end because um, I'm like the warm-up act for the bar. Uh, so last year we had some dub poetry. Uh, this year you've got me. Um, and I'm going to try and go from the ridiculous to the sublime. So we'll start off with some dirty stuff and then we'll move on to something a bit better. Um, but it's certainly a five o'clock talk. Um, and uh, not to be taken too seriously. So we've all been hearing about Charles Darwin and here's his life on a single slide and what he did and what he achieved and where he went and what he wrote and so forth. And we all see him as this very um, larger than life, grand character in science. Um, and in fact, you know, we put him on banknotes, we put him on postage stamps but the Darwin we put in on, as the icon of Darwin is this old guy with the beard. Um, and, you know, he's a superb scientist. He's an agreeable family man. And he has uh, the, this facial hair, uh, which makes him, you know, like the equivalent of a silverback gorilla in terms of his pre prominence in society. But he wasn't always like that. He was once a young man filled with hormones and filled with this very promiscuous curiosity. And let's have a look at where that takes us at the young Darwin. So let's go from Saint Darwin to Sinner Darwin or sensuous, silly, substance abusing Darwin uh, for a few minutes um, before we get back to Darwin's grandeur. Here's a really bad pun coming up. Let's get down and dirty with Darwin. So when he was a young boy, he was uh, a very naughty boy. He admitted it himself in, in the autobiography. I'm not going to go through each of these quotes here, but you can see here uh, that he believed he was a naughty boy. He, 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 he made deliberate falsehoods. He stole fruit. He beat a puppy just for the sake of it. Um, and his father actually said, you care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching. You'll be a disgrace to yourself and all your family. And here's a picture of the young Darwin. This was actually created by a Soviet artist. So in the Soviet Union, Darwin was idolised and they actually got some artists to paint pictures from various stages of his life. So this is an imagination of Darwin as a naughty young boy. But of course he went to Cambridge and he then turned into a student. And students are not always very well behaved either, uh, as a generalisation at least, I mean, I think the current generation perhaps drink less than previous ones, but I still think that they are a little bit uh, Darwinian in their approach. Darwin's approach was, I spent three years at Cambridge and the time was wasted um, as far as studies are concerned. Um, and as it says here, we sometimes drank too much with jolly singing and playing at cards afterwards. So this iconography of Darwin as the man with the beard, the old guy, is so fixed that actually in the Darwin Bicentenary in Christ College, which is his college in Cambridge, they actually commissioned a statue of him as a young man. And this is one of the few depictions you'll see of Darwin as a young man. This is from one of his contemporaries. This is Darwin on a beetle. Because uh, Darwin, like the previous uh, speaker, was obsessed with beetles um, in his, his young life. Um, and uh, he went off collecting them. Here's an interesting story that one of his associates um, tells about how they uh, went for a long walk, they went back to his rooms, uh, to the, they had something to eat, and then they fell asleep in their armchairs, um, and fell asleep until three in the morning. Um, and Darwin's a friend who was at St. John's College suddenly had to get out of Christ and, and rush back to his own college uh, because there was a... Uh, uh, a rule that he had to be back by midnight. Now you can look at that and see that's a jolly little story about, yeah, okay, so the guy had to climb over the fence and it was all a bit naughty or whatever. But think about it. Normal people don't fall asleep in armchairs like that. Certainly not young people. They were pissed out of their heads and they got so drunk that they fell into an alcoholic stupor is the only explanation for that. In fact, one of Darwin's contemporaries at Cambridge, Albert Way, wrote, uh, produced this kind of mock coat of arms. Um, and this, I give a hat tip here to John Van Wy, who shared this 
uh, around the time of the Darwin Bicentenary. He wrote a nice book about Darwin in Cambridge. Um, and if you look at this carefully, you can see uh, a certain degree uh, or a, a thread running through it. Like that there are beer tank hoods, there are cross tobacco pipes, meerschaum pipes, cigars, uh, wine barrel. Um, and basically, yeah, this is, as we see today, student substance abuse, serial substance abuse, not just one substance, but at least two uh, the, the tobacco and the alcohol. Um, and it's worth stressing that uh, we have no evidence that he used things like opiates. But um, his brother, Erasmus Darwin, certainly did become an opium addict in later life. And his grandfather, uh, Erasmus Darwin, actually probably killed his grandmother by giving her too much opium. So, you know, there is, there is this thread in the Darwin family. OK, he did all that at Cambridge. He managed to just about pass his exams, I think. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if he actually did graduate in the end, did he? I can't remember. But anyway, he went off around the world on the Beagle. Um, that was the making of him, and it was, uh, as we heard earlier, the, one of the, the most uh, amazing voyages of discovery ever in terms of its payback. Um, and then he came back, and he settled down in London uh, for a few years. And here again is another Soviet painting of Darwin uh, with his wife there. Um, Emma Darwin, Emma Wedgwood, before she married him, uh, sitting with his father. Um, and uh, Darwin actually kept lots of notebooks. He did this on the Beagle, but he also did it when he came back. Um, when I was researching the uh, rough guide to evolution, I actually sat down and, 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 and skimmed through these notebooks. And it was a, a great eye-opener, I have to say, compared to the, the, the mature Darwin of, of later years of what he actually wrote then. Um, so if we look in the C&D notebooks, you can see he's got a dirty line. You know, it's a typical young male, unattached young male with uh, you know, female genital organs, makes some abstract pictures, one of producing monkeys. He's got this kind of dirty imagination here, that instinctive desires in women similar to that of the bitch. You know, kind of, it's almost like a rap artist view of women, isn't it? You know, like those are bitches. Um, change from caterpillar to butterfly. Uh, he, he, he makes uh, a, an allusion here between the change from in, in, in this situation and what happens when a young woman grows breasts. Uh, so, you know, he's got a weird and very fertile imagination there. When you get to the M and N notebooks, uh, this kind of dirty theme is, is even more evident there. So he talks about a student when he was drunk, used to call everyone a bastard. Uh, a, a case for Shrewsbury gentleman who tried to have sex with a turkey. He goes on about dogs smelling each other's bottoms. He makes this parallel between the stallions licking the udders of mares and men's interest in women's breasts, uh, links between salvation and sex. Um, he wonders why ab all abnormal sexual actions or impulses are held in such a bonds. Is he trying to tell us something there, that he's been up to some of these things, or he feels like he wants to do it? I don't know. He says, a man shivers from fear, sublimity, sexual ardour, cries from grief and joy and sublimity. So sex is on his mind. But the actual, the grossest quote, I think, from these uh, notebooks is this one here, where he talks about, we feel no much, it should not feel much surprise that male animals smelling the vaginas of females, when it's re recollected that the smell of one's own pud, which is pudendum, own, one's own genitals, are not disagreeable. And he points out a orangutan at the zoological gardens touched the genitals of a young male and smelt its fingers. Okay, so it's a bit gross. But you think about it, how does he know that his own genitals smell okay? He's been putting his hand down his trousers, scratching himself and then sniffing it. You know, that's a view of Darwin that you don't see when you have all these people digging it up about the origin of species and all that kind of stuff. So that, that's the low point now. Um, uh, uh, and now we, we move on, okay? So that was Darwin uh, uh, as um, uh, a, a rather um, jiggy young man uh, thinking about all these kind of points. Let's now, just for the last few minutes of, of, the, uh, of the afternoon, talk about Darwin's grandeur. So obviously the high point was when he published The Origin of Species on November 24, 1859. Uh, he described it as, uh, after 13 months and 10 days hard labour, as we've heard earlier, the actual incubation period for this work was many, many decades before that. 
um, and his Richard Dawkins bigging it up, uh, you know, never were so few, so many effects explained by so few assumptions, uh, uh, just how wonderful this is. Now, uh, the reason I put all these pictures of sunsets is that there is a uh, phrase in one of Darwin's letters where he points out with a book as with a fine day, one wants it, or likes it to end with a glorious sunset. Now, if we're going to talk about the origin, uh, the origin of species, the, the, the book, we can't talk about the whole of that. In, in, even in a single day, we could, you know, if we went through every chapter, we'd never finish. So we have to uh, focus down. So let's focus down on what Darwin did at the end of the origin of species. And what was the phrase that he used there, the final sentence? Well, here it is. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers, having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And whilst this planet has gone cycling on from the fixed law of gravity, endless forms, most wonderful and most beautiful, have been now being evolved. <sighs> I have to take a breath. It's 57 words long. If a student wrote that in, in one of their assignments, you'd say, come on, break it down. Make it, you know, the gunning fog index is probably too high or whatever. Um, and it's scarcely grammatical. If you try and parse it out, it's, it's hard. But uh, we heard about Tinbergen's four questions, uh, Aristotle's four causes. Let, let's have a look at this particular uh, sentence uh, in view of the relationships between form, function, and phylogeny. Before we do that, it's just worth saying that plenty of people have cottoned on to this part of the origin as the most memorable part. Uh, various books have used it as the bits of it as the title. Um, and I'll just show you in, in this uh, book uh, by Ian McEwan, Saturday, the most bizarre and kind of surreal use of this is, is here's a quote from that book uh, where um, the author imagines the protagonist in the book waking up and hearing there is grandeur in this view of life in the sound of a hairdryer. Uh, as his partner is drying her hair. Um, uh, and, you know, it's kind of a slightly weird feeling that you're waking up in the morning and you, and you hear this, this is, there is grandeur in this view of life. He points out that this is actually Darwin and the, the guy had been reading Darwin in the bath the night before, and it was obviously the residual of that. But he points out, here is a curious, uh, five hundred pages of only one pollution, endless beautiful forms. This is a grandeur, a bracing kind of consolation in the brief... Um, privilege of consciousness. <coughs> now I put this slide back in, I took it out because I thought I put too many slides, I put it back in because you mentioned earlier this whole business of stamp collecting and this is a, uh, a way which physics, physicists, I think it's Rutherford said, it either, also it's either physics or stamp collecting um, and there is this kind of physics envy in biology but Darwin got there very early on by sort of saying actually um, it, w physics is boring he pointed at this was from one of his B note books. He made this uh, analogy between explaining gravity and explaining evolution. But in that phrase, he, you know, uh, he, he just dismisses physics. That's just cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity. You know, biology is so much more interesting. And I think everyone in the room, unless there's a physicist here, uh, would agree with us. And even the physicists wouldn't be here if they probably didn't agree with us. So, but let's have a look a bit more at this what he's written here. These blue bits don't actually quite fit, do they? Having been originally breathed. So what, what's that, where's that come from? Where, where's the origins of that phrase? Um, and the have been and are being evolved. Not have evolved, but have been and are being evolved. It's a slightly odd turn to phrase here. Um, and I guess most people in the room will recognise where having ori been originally breathed comes from. It's Darwin. He's imbibed the Bible and the Genesis story where God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's what Darwin uses here in this final um, uh, sentence here. And now you can argue, well, hang on, I, I, this is not science, this is not right. Um, and Darwin actually recognised that himself. Uh, he got um, wrapped over the knuckles uh, by Owen in a review. And it says here, your reviewer sneers with justice at my use of the, ter of, of the pentateuchal terms. 
uh, in a purely scientific work. I ought perhaps not to have used such terms, but they may well serve to, conf uh, to confess our ignorance is profound as the origin of life on the origin of, uh, as the, on the origin of force or matter. Um, and this idea of natural selection and the idea of uh, have, have been evolved it implies agency, and again, Darwin sort of said here, like talking to the natural selection, I had to commence de novo. I'd have said natural preservation uh, because it's not quite such uh, a degree of agency in there. Uh, Gillian Beer, a few years ago, when she wrote uh, Darwin's plot, she, she latched onto this and pointed out that Darwin's use of language, there were some difficulties here because he's, he's saying that there's no place for a, a creator uh, in, in many ways, he's explained away all that sort of stuff. But then he uses terms like selection and preservation, and that begs the question of who's doing that. Um, and she points out that he's really struggling because he's imbibed all this language and this way of thinking from the Bible and from natural theology and so forth, and he, he's trying to write against the grain of his discourse. So we, kind of, we can probably forgive him for that, I suppose, for, for those kind of things. The biggest fanboy on Darwin's language is a guy called Michael Halliday, who died a couple of years ago. He's one of the giants of uh, linguistics in the UK. Um, and this is what he had to say when he analysed uh, the, this sentence here, well, in fact, the last paragraph. He said, this resounding lexicogrammatical cadence brings the clause, the sentence, the paragraph, the chapter, and the book to a crashing conclusion with a momentum to which I can think of no parallel elsewhere in literature. Perhaps only Beethoven has produced comparable effects and that in another medium altogether. So, you know, this is Darwin as the ode to joy. I mean, it, it is a remarkable uh, parallel there, but there is some uh, reasons for thinking that. He's pointed out these three different reasons, phonologically, grammatically, semantically, how much weight the final word evolved and that's the only time that Darwin ever used the E word in The Origin of Species, how much weight it is carrying. Um, um, and he points out, you know, all that's going on if you just look at the clause, how that word evolved sits within the clause. Um, but then if you look uh, uh, more carefully at uh, these, these kind of parallels that have been uh, put by Darwin in this, you know, parallels between the planet and, and life forms, cycling, the, 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 you know, the Newtonian boring cycling, and then have been and are being evolved, the fixed law of gravity, left out the laws of natural selection, but it's kind of implicit in there. So all of this kind of, these uh, things are all being held in the balance there. Um, and uh, you know, within the sense the word evolve has to carry this cumulative problem to match the existing uh, selection of voice. Again, Halliday makes a point about the, the creator. Um, Yet all this load of work is hardly worth mentioning beside the major responsibility of the word evolved, which has to bear, which is that it's sustaining the climax of 450 pages of intense scientific argument. This is the culmination to which the entire text has been building up. And Halliday says, it would be hard to find anywhere else in English a sentence or a clause or a group or a word which has been made to carry such an awesome semiotic load. So he... he Halliday, in this work, he speculates, I don't know how long it took Darwin to compose these two paragraphs, whether he consciously reflected on this, uh, he imagines not. But he says, this is a writer producing a text which he knows is unique and will have a unique place in the history of ideas. Now, coming back to Timberg's multiple different explanations for things, let's have a now have a look at where did this phrase come from, this phraseology, where did this sentence come from, um, and can we look at that? Now, one of the things that we have to realise is that there is no such thing as the origin of species. There were six different editions. So just as uh, a few years ago when they sequenced the human genome, we said the human genome isn't Craig Venter. Uh, there is more to the human genome than just one instance uh, of it. And similarly, when you look at the origin, you have to look at all this variation that goes on between these different editions. Um, he, 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 the book grew by a third, and he rewrote m many passages four or five times. So in a sense, you can, com you can, if you treat the origin of species as a textual genome, you can do some comparative genomics and apply these kinds of tools. Um, and just over 10 years ago, we started doing that. So this idea of using trees and this idea of descent with modification beyond biology actually has a very long history. 
Um, so contemporaries of Darwin, Karl Lachmann and August Schleicher, uh, use this kind of tree-like thinking in other disciplines. So Karl Lachmann started looking at manuscript affiliations and drew trees, and he, this was called stematics. Um, August Schleicher looked at the variations between uh, and the affiliations between different languages and realized that these also shape the same thing. So about 10 years ago, um, one of my colleagues, Barbara Bordaleo, uh, started looking at this idea of could we compare all these different uh, ver ver uh, varieties of the origin of species, and she actually used digital humanities approaches and created an online variorum of the origin of species, where she compared and uh, catalogued all the variations between the different things. So you can go online to Darwin Online, and you can find this there, and you can work through and you can compare any edition with any other edition, just like doing a genome alignment and see what changes between them. Now, one of the little vignettes that she put in this, which I, I just dragged off the page, is uh, um, she, the thing that actually most caught her attention was this bit here, the second sentence in this historical section. Um, the great majority of naturalists believe that species are mutable productions and have been separately created. Uh, that's what Darwin said uh, in the original uh, uh, versions of the, um, uh, the origin. But as you get to the fifth edition, suddenly it changes to, until recently, the great majority of naturalists believed uh, that species were mutable productions and had been separately created. So she points out this is the time when the, this is the stage of the world change for Darwin, where people's views changed uh, dramatically, um, and he won, basically won the argument. Okay, 1859 is the event horizon. That was the, the year in which the origin of species was published. Now, people, when they look at... Yeah, I know. People, people when they look at... Uh, I've got just three or four more slides. Uh, people, when they look at um, uh, the evolution of life, they look at cellular life forms, and then they see, well, can we go back beyond that and see the origin of the genetic code and so forth? What, what can we see here? Well, we can actually go back because Darwin wrote an essay in 1844... Uh, and he closed the essay with a, sim uh, a sentence that you can see is clearly homologous to the sentence that closes the origin of species. And in fact, before that, two years earlier, in 1842, he wrote what was known as the pencil sketch. And you can see that actually the way in which this thing evolved was not by adding words, but largely by cutting them out. So the earlier versions are actually longer uh, than the version uh, that appeared. And the only change that, the only words that were shoved in in the version that went in the origin of species is, is this uh, active uh, present tense agency here of are being evolved. So if you want to draw a cladogram, you can draw a cladogram with the pencil sketch, the essay, and the origin of species. So This pencil sketch was uh, found in a cupboard at Down House, a cupboard under the stairs, um, and uh, this is the, the, the front page of it uh, from 1842. And this is the relevant bit. Now, you can't read that very clearly from where you're sitting, but let's zoom in. And this brings hairs up on the back of my neck to when you actually can see Darwin with a pencil scribbling down this phrase for the first time here. Uh, it's just uh, um, this thing, you know, we've got to find it, but, uh, where we've got there is grandeur in this view. Uh, there is a simple grandeur, and, and this is the beginning of that particular sentence. Anyway, I think I've uh, run out of time, I've finished what I want to say. Um, a few years ago, for the Darwin Bicentenary, I uh, persuaded uh, a lit hop artist. Um, Barbara Brinkman, who actually produced the Rap Guide to Evolution alongside the Rough Guide to Evolution that I was writing. Uh, I gave him lots of things to, to read. He read Daniel Dennett's Dangerous, uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea and so forth. And he produced this final track of his album that he produced, uh, which is called Darwin's Acid. And let's just play that now as we finish. Um, let's just check. It's only it's like three minutes, that's all. Yes, 
say the blood of Jesus shall stop us. Is he the original of the actions? That is grand, but it is still alive. But it's several times that they made a rigid way to drive you forward to the new one. And that blood is coming to the arms like they all know in the next single one of the world. For it's a single day, written in his form, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderful, and it's happy. There we are. That's me finished. Thank you very much.